anybody here ever solved a differential equation? Yeah, so, you know, differential equations, what a pain in the ass. There's really, for an interesting differential equation, there is no simple pedestrian way. We start here, we try, you know, we do go through these steps to get the solution. They just don't work that way. There's a few that do, but they don't. Those ones aren't on the final, right? So what you do is you learn a lot. And what it looks like when you're a freshman and you have a TA who solves the problem on the, on the whiteboard, it looks like she's pulling something out of her hat. It's like, I'll never think of that in a test. There's no way I'm just gonna come up with that. But later, as you become a junior and senior, you realize that the building up of, experiment, of experience gives you an edge. And what that edge is, is you try things that worked before. And that's how you solve differential equations. Magnetism is a similar case. In a, mag a magnet is manifestly asymmetric, right? It's got a north pole, a south pole, but the equations that describe magnetism are radially symmetric. The equations have spherical symmetry. The solutions do not. They like to have north and south poles. They're dipoles. They like to be quadrupoles. They don't have radial symmetry. So that's similar to what's going on in the standard model. So with another interesting thing with magnets, which is directly related, is that if you take a, a bar magnet and you heat it up, there is a well-defined temperature called the Curie point where it loses its magnetism. Where the equations that describe that magnetic field go from being manifestly asymmetric to being bing at one temperature, they suddenly become radially symmetric. Starts to sound a lot like what might have happened at the Big Bang. A very hot universe cools, and as it cools, something happens. So this is, this is what happens. Particles obtain their masses through interaction with something that pervades, that permeates the vacuum. The vacuum really is something special. And it's got this background, the canvas of this, of this painting might be the Higgs field. That heavy particles are constantly interacting, that the Higgs is slowing them down like a viscous fluid. Whereas massless particles don't interact with the Higgs. They go zipping right through. Photons, light, is massless. So where the iron filings line up with the magnetic field, the particles line up with the Higgs field. The top is the heaviest one on there, 171 times the mass of a proton. And it lines up with that Higgs really sharp. It's got a very, very strong coupling. So that's the idea of how the Higgs works. So now we turn to the straw experiment. During the Big Bang, at the beginning of time, the beginning of space, the beginning of space-time. The universe was so hot that the energies of these particles were just way, way bigger than their rest energy, than their mass. So if we look at Einstein's famous equation, e equals mc squared, and then write it down the way it's actually used by physicists, which is to say it's the rest mass, m0, times the speed of light squared, plus the energy of motion, in this case, the thermodynamic energy. But that thermodynamic energy was so much larger than the rest energy that it was effectively massless, that these particles were massless, okay, when it was hot. So then the universe cooled. The universe cools. We press down on the straw, and as it cools more and more, the straw bends. It picks a direction and bends. It's no longer, it no longer has that typical spherical or um, cylindrical symmetry that we look for in a straw. It's a broken symmetry. And when that symmetry breaks, the particles begin to interact with the Higgs and obtain mass. The Higgs then becomes prominent at those temperatures and below. So you look at your straw and you say, but you know, it didn't have this quirky little thing in it. 
then maybe if I pressed it just right with all perfect symmetry, then it'd collapse on itself like that. Kind of like flipping a coin and having it land on its side. You probably managed to do it, but I bet you couldn't right now. Something happens. Now, whether the universe was symmetric before it cooled, or whether there was an underlying asymmetry that caused this symmetry to be broken in a given way, just like the straw chooses a direction when I push down on it. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. The particles have mass. So this is then the fabric reality with the Higgs boson. So the geometry of space-time dictates the laws of nature. Noether's theorem gives us that. And the space-time vacuum is saturated with this Higgs field. So if we want to detect this Higgs field, well, how do you detect the canvas on a painting? You're looking at the painting, right? How do you do it? Well, you have to bring the canvas to light. You got to move some paint off. We have to do something. And here, we have to inject energy into the system. The current state of um, our space-time interval, any random spot, this spot of space-time right here in my hand, is too cool for there to be any Higgs. So we have to inject energy in to get one to pop out. So the idea is basically like this. If, the, if we think of the Higgs field as a, as a pool of water, then a wave in that pool is a Higgs particle. We have to give them energy. So yes, there's your, the experiment, the very expensive green box of experiment. Is this true or false? It's a broken symmetry. You have a concrete prediction, do an experiment. So that's what these experiments are doing at Fermilab and at CERN.